everybody. I'm Termite Watkins and my partner, Mr. S, and we have got a special day for you today. Uh, this is going to be exciting. Good friend, Jeff Barnett, and I don't even know how to introduce you because you do so many things, so we're going to get into some of those. Well, Jeff Barnett is a, a real close friend of mine, and uh, he's my partner, I should say, in boxing with Termite, and uh, we... We managed a certain fighter together, but really we've gotten to be really close friends. So this is a special day, and we're glad and to have you with us. So Jeff. business owner, entrepreneur, you also I think sit on the board for the Wheelhouse Foundation. Did I miss anything? Yes, no, no. Um, I was introduced to speak recently, and somebody listed off everything I did. And as they were listing off the things I did, they said some things that I had forgotten that I did. So, <laughs> so I believe it. I believe um, it. The key thing I found is that if I can build something in a, with a system around it, I can go do something else. You are a systems guy. Yeah, it's it's, it's painful because I try to systematize everything, but but uh, I, I I have found something I can. And it's the boxing. Uh, the boxing is definitely a non systematizable uh, organization, so it's a lot of fun though. So it makes it more fun because you just can't control it. That's right. Yeah. Jeff, yeah. take us back in history. You've got a neat story, and that's what we do is we tell stories. Uh, on this show we we tell stories and i love your story because it's a uh, from where you were to where you're at now go back in history tell us a little bit about jeff barnett got it um so the the piece that i don't i normally start like when i talk about business i start at around 20 and i'll run sure. from there uh termites asked me to start a little before that i crashed and burned uh completely in high school uh i um by the time I was 16, I was locked up and uh, physically detoxing. I came off of all sorts of stuff. I won't list everything because this will be seen in public. Wow. <laughs> but but uh, I came off of everything, and uh, by the time I was 17, I realized I couldn't drink anymore. I hadn't drank anything in over 30 years. Um, that, that was kind of the first. You know, I've had a couple crash and burns in my life, but that was kind of the first thing that I hit that I, I needed help getting out of. But then I was able to come back from that. That was kind of the first major comeback. That's 16 years old. Yeah, 16, I started trying to get sober. I got sober and have stayed sober since I was 17. So Wow. Um, I'm not a unicorn. I mean, I've met other guys that have done it. But uh, it's not common. Most people need a little more experience with, sure. with suffering before they're ready to make the changes needed. So. so you're a quick learner. You said, hey, I don't want this. There's two qualifications you need. You need to find that you cannot quit when you want to. You need to find that if you uh, start drinking, you can't control how much you drink. If you hit those two things, normal people will never understand those things, and that's okay. But if you hit those two things, you have to stop. I mean, it's just a progressive thing. So when I realized I'd hit both qualifications, I was able to find a way to get off of it. And I'll unabashedly say that the way is God. I mean, there is no, no non-spiritual answer that I've found. So, um, yeah, so that was kind of my big first turning point where I crashed and burned. Um, I did not finish high school proper. Uh, I, I went the GED route and then got into business. Uh, I bounced around from some jobs that weren't, uh, there was more about learning like what I didn't want to do. Um, I had always been kind of entrepreneurial. I'd seen it in my family. Um, so uh, when I, I ended up moving up to Chicago and there I got a job with a company called Texas Flange. I worked as a commission salesman. And this is something, I, I saw this in your first episode. You're talking about success is hard and you, people don't get that. Um, and they get Emphasi out there. I want to emphasize that. Yeah. Cause it is, it's not easy. It looks yeah. easy sometimes. Yeah. And when you get into that mode and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm done with whatever I'm doing, I'm leaving that behind and I'm going to go into some kind of success. I'm going to, I'm going to find some success and you start working towards it. You don't realize how hard it was. Um, and so, and then like, uh, for instance, my sister says everything Jeff touches turns to gold. And it's like, well, you forgot about the divorce and the bankruptcy. <laughs> and the, <laughs> exactly. You know, Cause you know, I, I see you now you run a very successful business. I won't, steal your thunder, but you are very successful now. So yeah, the, the, what it took to get there is kind of what you're telling me. Sure. So I get this job on a commission basis. My first check was at 90 days. I made $123. So I needed to be making reasonable income in four months. Uh, I was able to get to that point. I had my income replaced in six months. I doubled it in a year. And uh, I gradually, over a 10-year period of time, worked my way into being able to buy half of that company. And then after another six or seven years, I bought the rest of it. And uh, I never held back on the guy that's founded it. I always was giving him my best. But whenever something seemed to, like, 
I was operating at 100%, but once I started to own it, you know, then I was found that extra 10 or 20. Just um, dug deeper. Just leaned into it. But um, you never held back is what you're saying. Yeah, I never purposely held back. I've seen people do that. They'll hold back oh, yeah. on the guy that they're working for because they see this, like, you know, they're getting in their 60s. Maybe I'll be able to buy it, and they want to kind of save that thing. I never saved anything. One of the things we did that was kind of unique, 1997, I set up a website for the company. And today it's twice visited as much as the number two person in our industry. Wow. Uh, TexasFlange.com is the most visited in its industry by a factor of two. And started in 97. That's, you know, but, dot com early days. And in every way I've tried to be in first in what I do and then I'm copied. And so. Uh, Got to reinvent yourself. Yeah. About 2010, I decided I was going to do something they couldn't copy. So I put a million dollars into putting all the CAD drawings online. So. Um, and that's, that has not been replicated, nor will it be. Nobody else is crazy enough to do that. <laughs> it took me eight years to get it done. Got to so. make big moves to get big results. Yeah. So that's been, uh, that's been fantastic. And, you know, the, I've got other business things I do and, you know, I don't know, but you know, I don't know enough about me. Let's, let's talk no, about what no, we're, no, no, not, we're, we're not, here I, for you. I, I so saw, hey, we, I, we I, don't I, make you bashful, but you have a story that we just need people need to hear. I yeah. understand. I saw what you guys did in your first episode. And I kind of have a feeling of where you're going. And I also kind of think that this is kind of the starting of something. I think this is going to go on the radio or on TV pretty quick. Um, so I, I kind of think what you're doing is kind of more interesting right now than the stuff that I'm doing. That's so funny <laughs> so. because that is not my perspective whatsoever because I know about you. So I don't know you as well as Termite does. What's interesting for me is I'm getting to know more of you just telling these stories because we've talked quite a few times, and I've already learned stuff about you I didn't know. Um, so tell more about that because I still want to emphasize to people of how crappy things kind of were for you and how tough it was and okay. the things that you had to do because I think if you saw in the first episode, I think when people look at successful people like you, they do, they, th they think it's easy. You know, you do boxing, you do your deal. And people, I'm sure you've heard this, oh, you're so lucky. Things just work out for you. Everything you touch turns to gold. And then say, you don't know the half of it. Right. So let me help out on this just for a second. I want to feed into what you sure. just said. <clears throat> when did you start drinking? All right, we, we're hearing about your great side. See, I, yeah, so, the so, negative point. I got you. So I, I love my parents. My, my parents were great parents. So I don't like to talk about when I started drinking. <laughs> okay, so we won't put in actual age, but it was early. <laughs> it was very early, very early. Okay. And it wasn't that I was in a chaotic environment. I was just, it was Pasadena, it was 80s, and there was just easy Nothing access. Nothing else to do. Easy access, easy access. And not just at my house, you know, it was pretty much in the neighborhood. So, um, but yeah, so I had a, my, my whole career in that was maybe seven, eight years. Yeah. So... You know, it brings back some memories. I, I'm telling off a little bit on myself. Uh, there was a family that used to keep some alcohol in their cabinet. And I won't name any other names, but we used to sneak in there and get that when we had the occasion or when the opportunity. It was there available. And their parents didn't ever think about us doing it. But we used to go in there and get that and sip it. And they didn't even know we were taking it. Well, we did more than sip, and what I, what, I found, <laughs> what I found is that if you if you dilute it enough, you have to add food coloring. <laughs> uh, I'll explain that. Well, when you drink half of a man's bottle and, <laughs> and you fill it with water, he's going to okay, notice that something's you. not quite right. You. But when you drink ninety percent of it and you fill it with water, you got to add. Food I'm coloring. following now. <laughs> so. Now you are you chairman, or you're on the board for the wheelhouse? Yeah, the wheelhouse is an interesting program. They. Uh, the average person, this is what people don't understand, if you get like if you get in trouble with drugs and alcohol, you figure you, you know, you'll have to quit, right? Well, sure. When people try to quit, it's about a one in twenty chance you're gonna make it to a year. Wow. Now with the wheelhouse, we have a program that we take these guys through and if they can complete a ninety day program, they have a sixty six percent chance of getting to a year. Now that's pretty dramatic when you think of taking somebody that has a one in 20 chance and then you convert it to a two and three. Sure. So the way we do that is we have a very specific program that doesn't look like most treatment and it's completely funded in house. So we cannot, we can't really go out for any kind of large grants or definitely not federal funding because they would insist that we professionalize some of the things we do. Sure. It's, it's almost completely compromised essentially. Yeah, well, 
Yeah, it's almost completely non-professional. So it's just publicly supported. Uh, the city of Deer Park has been banned. But it's effective, and you will not compromise for oh, good yeah, reason. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're not going to compromise on it. So I got on the board of that a few years ago and then uh, gradually worked my way. I, you know, I, I Normally, if I get into an organization, I'll find, like, where's the problem point? And I get sucked into that. And uh, I really I really hate accounting. I've always despised the accounting side of businesses. And then I got an MBA back in 17, and I really focused in on accounting. Accounting started to seem like a language that I could understand. I started liking that. So I got on the board of directors of the wheelhouse, and I got sucked right into treasurer. So, <laughs> so now I'm doing accounting. Now now I file for five different entities, and plus the sixth one is the wheelhouse. Wow. And I get to learn all about the way to do taxes for nonprofits and all that. And it's just it's like one more thing I probably didn't need to put on my plate, but it's it's been a blessing, and it's definitely where my passion lies. Jeff, how many people a year do you think the wheelhouse helps? Yeah, I count the money. No, I uh, <laughs> it's, uh, serious. Seriously, there's That's a, a question there's a, dodge there, right there. Yeah, there's there's a thirty there there's a thirty day program and then a ninety day program in the sober living home. Uh, across all that, we house eighty. Uh, we can house up to eighty guys. We normally are sitting around seventy five. Um, our typical when someone calls to get in, there's typically. Uh, wait. Yeah, six. There's normally six calls for every one person that gets in. Oh wow! So it's free. So when it's you know, sure, you know, when, sure. It, when you're offering something for free, it's you know there's demand. There's a lot of demand in the area to begin with, and then you have a free program. It helps. Um, so within the uh, thirty day house, there's uh, twenty eight uh, beds in the thirty day house, and those are always full, turning over. Wow. So probably somewhere around four hundred a year. Oh wow, that's incredible. So going back to you, I love putting you on the hot spot because I can do it right now. Um, I'm thinking okay. of ways I can get back to you. With the different ways <laughs> that we have connection, how can I hurt you back? Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so Jeff, tell me more about what they do at the wheelhouse. What, how, why do, I know a little bit about it. I know that it works. It really works. I've met people in there. What do y'all do there that's different? The primary thing that makes it different is the key person helping the person that's going through it is someone who's been through it, who's now living successfully outside of it, who's coming back to work with them. And that, that, that aspect of it, and and they're doing it for free. So the guys that are coming back to work with them, none of those guys are paid. And they're so so thankful for what it did for their life that they essentially want to give back. Right. Yeah. And it helps them to stay sober because they're (laughs) helping the guys that are going through. So the alumni aspect of the wheelhouse is the absolute biggest magic sauce in it so awesome so jeff going back in your history all right you started all this stuff at a young age by the time you were in your what mid-teens late teens you were hitting it pretty hard wasn't you yes i was doing enough that i needed to get sober and found i couldn't so to get physiologically addicted to this stuff it takes a little bit of effort what made you realize you needed help Really, it was that I I was starting to fail. I had a counselor. Yeah, I'm make trying. Me, you're gonna make me talk about stuff I don't <laughs> want to talk. About. So I had a counselor ask me why I was failing two classes, and I said, you know, I didn't like the teacher, and uh, she said it's two classes, and I could tell that she really cared, and I kind of wanted to tell her the truth, but I knew if I told her the truth, I'd have to stop. Mm-hmm. So. Um, hmm. When I started looking at that, and then I lost the girl, crashed the car, um, just there was a lot of indicators that it was time to do something different. So when I decided I was going to take a break, I wasn't thinking anything crazy, just maybe like 30 days, maybe 90 days, try to get my grades up, try to get my – I found I couldn't. Uh, and, and I found very quickly I couldn't. And it was strange. It was a strange thing because I've got this iron will, and it's like dangerous. It's like when I put some of my mind to something, I just, I'll just grind out and do it. Um, it's probably why I'm successful in business. But That's definitely uh, why you're successful. Probably. But, uh, but you're it, saying you couldn't overcome this one by also, yourself. Yeah. So whenever I really, really wanted to and I couldn't stop, it was like that was a, that was the Just a flag. Yeah. I was like, there has to be a problem. I started thinking I was crazy. And then, then I found some people that told me I was crazy, just not in the crazy way I thought <laughs> I was. It was just regular old alcohol. You're still crazy. crazy, just not that way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, 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 Jeff, did you go cold turkey? Did you have people helping you? How did you stop? I made, uh, I made one attempt where I went cold turkey, and uh, I had to go back out and check one more thing. I wanted to make sure that I couldn't drink socially. So I went out to have two drinks, and I drank two bottles of wine, and I drove home in a blackout. 
and I haven't I haven't had a drink since then. Wow, so, that's so, incredible. Yeah, yeah. So, so that that's seventeen, and yeah, yeah. Well, it's some of the things that y'all don't know about Jeff, me and him are partners in our boxing, and and we could we could actually uh, I'm just spilling my guts to the people. We could really be making a lot more money in the boxing promotions, but I won't have alcohol uh, at the fights and. You have so you know, gracefully stood behind me when it's your money we've been losing. And thank you so much because I couldn't, I, I just can't serve alcohol. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I, I bought a, uh, I bought the local coffee shop, the co- coffee roaster across mm-hmm. the street from me because I could see they're about to go out of business. So I went in and I made them an offer. Can and I what's that them? name of that place? Uh, I don't want to mention the name of it, you know, but if you make me Paraland Coffee Roasters, <laughs> that's Paraland, P E F. So, so, uh, so I bought this in 2015 and, uh, by 2017, I was kind of grinding out, trying to get it to be profitable. And I had a bunch of people start telling me the same thing. They said, coffee in the morning, wine in the evening, you'll do better. And I'm like, I'm a Southern Baptist, okay? I can't sell wine, okay? <laughs> they'll, they'll run me off. I mean, I just the, the abuse I'll get at church, it's just not worth it, you know? Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so I've never, never sold alcohol out of that place. And uh, now we're like one of three. Uh, there's this like third wave coffee app thing. And it's like, the, it tells you where the real, true, third-wave coffee places are. There's three in Houston. We're one of them. And if I might say so, we're the best. So, but, well, uh, I but think yeah, that's, your that's, coffee's that's, incredible. Right. And that, that's kind of like a hobby business. I run it through a manager. It takes maybe two hours a week of my time at, at, at worst, sometimes 30 minutes. So, but, yeah, it's a fun thing. And it employs like uh, 11, 12 people. And, yeah, it's nice. Well, I know you hate to tell about what all you're accomplishing, but I'm going to pull it out of you. So, so later you, you, in life, you got your life going right. You started working for Texas Flange. You ended up buying part of it, and then you bought the rest of it. Am I correct? Right. All right. Uh, and the rest is history. I mean, it's just been a it's incredible. easy from there, right? Just easy, no no more problems after oh, yeah, yeah, alcohol, yeah. and you're you're good to go. No, no, no. I actually, uh, when I was still working as a salesman at Texas Flange, I was kind of getting this feeling that I was selling buggy whips. I thought maybe like oil was going to go away. Um, it, so this idea that oil is going to go away, it's been around for a while. Um, <laughs> so I was thinking that that uh, we were going to end up with like the petrochem industry was just going to slow down, and that they weren't going to need the product I sold. Um, so I, I said I was going to start a construction company with a guy, and uh, we went from idea to 10 employees in four months. Oh, wow. Uh, I jokingly said when we were going to start it, I said, if it doesn't work out, what's the worst that'll happen? I'll have to file bankruptcy. So I found that at a time where I was making $50,000 a year, I had $100,000 in debt, and I had a business that would no longer service it. So I was personally attached to all the debt from that company, and uh, that bankrupted me at 28. So oh, wow. I did that in the middle of, uh, like, the progression of Texas Flange. Just like, if you tell the Texas Flange story by itself, it looks like it's just, uh, you know, upwardly moving towards success. bringing the Jeff success. Barnett component. Yeah, but if you see this little first-rate construction in the middle of it, <laughs> that was a nightmare. But I learned stuff from that, and sure. I was able to apply that in, uh, in doing a lot of real estate stuff that I, I did uh, – in Texas when I moved back to Texas. Well, that's yeah. something. So you, you made a mistake and people learn from mistakes. So I think there's some people out there that need to be encouraged. Don't be scared of making mistakes. Now make calculated. Don't be so dumb that you might have to go bankrupt, but at the same time you could just sit and be super safe and do nothing. And then you're not really going to get anywhere, but you took some chances. You started yeah. the construction, obviously it didn't work out like you thought, but like you said, you learned some things from that. And I'm sure that's now, You've taken those nuggets, and it's made Texas Flange even better. Right. There's uh, there's certain things that, like, prior to taking control of Texas Flange, I have three different things that I saw clearly that I could have bankrupted the company doing that the owner, the founder of it, stopped me from doing. And then – so it was like I, I got it when I had learned those lessons. I had done some of those crazy risks, the – the stuff where we, we tell ourselves we're making an investment, but what we're really doing is gambling. You know, it's I've like, been there. I've yeah, got a yeah. couple of those. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I think we all have, and we learn from them. Um, but the, the key thing is that down that downward turn and making you know ha- taking that hit, uh, coming out of that, it's like there was a six-week period of time where it was just like every day a battle not to end my life. I mean, it was horrible. People under 
don't underestimate how bad it is or how hard it is to get back up. I mean, there's oh. a lot of this. You get knocked down, pop back up. You know, it's like that's not always easy. It might. That's take some why time. I want to emphasize it's not easy, yeah. and it, it looks easy now because you are successful, and it's easy to sit here in this chair and say, "Yeah, it was really hard." You can't even convey, you know, how hard it was. Yeah, I lived those six weeks. Like I lived those six. I remember the day I came in. I was living in an efficiency apartment in my late twenties after having been somewhat successful. And I remember walking in the day, and it was getting to be the evening, and I was about to lay down, and I thought, I haven't thought about taking my own life today. And I was like, (laughs) I was was blown away (laughs) by it. It's like, wow, this is fantastic. Um, But I ended up having to file bankruptcy from that, and I I walked out of the bankruptcy court, felt the sun hit my skin, and felt that it was still warm. And I was literally experiencing it from the standpoint of the sun still warms my skin. That's the level that I was just jacked up over wow. having to file. I didn't set out going like, you know, I'm, I, I guess I was flipping about it, but I didn't really think it was possible. So I went back to my office at that time, and uh, there was an order sitting on my desk. It, was the, it, was, it wasn't the largest pr- uh, profit order I'd ever gotten, but it was close. It was a decent order. And then the next day there was another one, and we literally started the boom that led into what Texas Flange is now. That, that boom started right as I was walking out of putting first-rate construction now. See? It was crazy. That, but you notice I still remember the name of that company. Of course you do. That was back in like 2001, 2000. But I still remember the name of that company. Because it's an impact. And, and I think something else that I want to emphasize, a lot of people out there, our listeners, they might not be where they want to be today, and they have this vision in their head, if I can just push forward, then I'll become successful. You did that. Like you said, you you actually did become successful. You made good money. Then you took a step back. Now you said you had to go backtrack. Now you're living in it. That's probably even harder to taste success and then have it fall back to get up a second time. I'm imagining that's even more mentally. If you guys keep doing this, what you're doing, you're going to find that most successful people, it, you get this idea that you run at this level spot and you decide, I'm going to start putting forth more effort and then you just go up. It's not. It's that's you know. exactly <laughs> what I want to. That's yeah, the point I want to make. People think it's a, yeah. it's a one time, one and done. I just got to push through, get up. If I make it over this, I'm good to go. No. Nope. Yeah, I was. It's, you're. It's. It's gonna be up and down unless you just kind of don't make any more decisions for the rest of your life. Right. I was, I was bankrupt at 28. And at 40, I was effectively retired. So today I do a lot of stuff. I I, I work hard. You do work I, hard. Or I, I work hard, but I work hard because I like doing it. Yes. Uh, and by, I do everything I, 40, I could do. I do everything I, I can to keep him working hard. And uh, like in the boxing, I want to talk about another thing that you've been really involved in. And on a real serious note, uh, let's talk about your boxing career. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff has actually fought. He is a, considered a fighter, a boxer. Tell us a little bit about your time in the ring. Yes, I'm a master's boxer, uh, amateur. Uh, I'm 1-0. I have an undefeated record, <laughs> and I'd like to challenge Mr. S while we're sitting here. A challenge. A challenge Whoa. for an exhibition match. Whoa. Challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. Now, now really? I have to talk to you. Wow, I'm, I'm shocked. I have to be honest with you. I just started training him. Are you changing? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious. Does that change I, anything? Well, no, 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 I'm no. I'm ready to go. It doesn't. No, he's already beat one of my the guys. Last time, it was one of the ones. He's he already was beat crazy. one of my guys. So, you know, I've heard that story. He, yes. Evan, if you're listening, I need you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds fun though. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. We should do something seriously. I'm game. So, what makes you like boxing so much? You know, I, I came to him one day. He was referred to me by some, another. Mutual friend of ours, great guy, and he jumped head into boxing and and still head in. I've done a lot of businesses that have made a lot of money, and I've done some businesses that have lost money. The businesses that make money are fun. The businesses that lose money aren't. It's a flat rule. Never never seen a business that lost money that was fun until I found boxing. (laughs) Yeah, boxing just burns cash, but but it's a lot of fun. It really is. I told my wife today, I think we're going to do the July fight, and she's like, you're just, you're, there's something wrong with you. There's just. <laughs> so what makes you like boxing so much? I've got my idea of, of what makes you like boxing so much. I want to hear what you, you have to say. I, 
I sort of looked at it in the 90s when people were knocking each other out and the heavyweights were, you know, those bouncing from Holyfield to Tyson. Tyson. And, you know, that, that was kind of the sweet spot for it. But, um, but then this last go around, I've, whenever I started watching and I started to understand the science behind it, I started to understand the hit, don't hit, uh, don't get hit, uh, the speed, the, the, the precision, the Mechanics. chess match. Yeah, the chess match of breaking somebody yeah. down over several. The and, sweet science. Yeah, the sweet science of it. And, the, and that, to me, more than anything, it, then the variety of it and then not the unknown, like as two fighters come together, is one of them going to box and one of them going to punch? Um, or like one of the things I like about Canela is watching how he can be a different fighter every fight. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes he's just well in a way, and other times he's more, more uh, guarded. And um, so that aspect, and then the you know the various different ways two two particular fighters can match up, and then you can see one trying to do something, and it may work, it may not, and yeah. you may be third round or fourth round. You start to see well that. Looked like it was going to work, but not so much. You know, as technical as he is right now, that's the way he is in the gym. When he's hitting a bag or where they're sparring, his mind's calculating things, and and he's got this force behind him, is wanting to perfect it. And you don't perfect boxing in uh, a month or two months or six months or six years. It's a never-ending game. Right. Well, I'm looking at Mr. S's arms, and I've already decided I'm hiring Tim Hallmark again. <laughs> I'm going to bring him in from Central Texas and have him work me How out. How is Tim Hallmark For, doing? Um, I talked to Tim not too long ago. He's doing good. He's doing yeah, good. Yeah. He's he's uh, he's getting drug into every kind of sport. It's crazy. So um, once you get the metrics, you know you can kind of apply those metrics. to. We talked to him on, on one of the other shows. I think Craig was had some run-ins with Tim Hallmark yeah. training other different sports, like yeah. you said. He's doing okay. all kinds of stuff. Are you, are you guys going to have him on this? You should. You should don't definitely. Don't know. You we think should, it's a good we idea? Should, we, should. Yeah, we should definitely have him. get him yeah. in here. We should yeah, have yeah, yeah, yeah. him. Tim, uh, for those of y'all that don't know, he is a, a master at training the body and perfecting the body. And uh, he can take the body. Evander Holyfield, he took him as a 175-pounder, blew him up to 125-pounders. 220. 225. Yeah. 220. Two, I'm sorry. 225, please excuse me. Blew him up to 225. Normally when you gain that kind of weight, you lose speed, you lose coordination, you lose power. And he gained speed. He gained power, gained coordination. Of course, he's got some pretty incredible machines that he's uh, he's built to create as well. Uh, Great guy, and we'll get him on here for you because he's a story in itself. And uh, anyway, so... I have to tell off when me and him are working together on one of our boxing promotions. Um, he actually works for me that night, <laughs> and uh, I own one one more percent than he does. And so, I got to tell you, he's the money man behind our our organization. And uh, but he's out there and he's sweeping floors and he's putting chairs up. And I say this real seriously. I admire that because you don't have to do it, and yet you take the time to help, just like everybody else. And I haven't—I t- probably haven't told you that enough, but thank you. I'm glad you admire it. I call that understaffed. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're doing what you got to do, and you're not above it. I will say this: the last time he didn't want to do that, he said, "Just pay somebody." And uh, well, I mean, it makes more sense money. to pay, but at the same time, you're still willing to do it. When we that, were figuring it out, we did yeah. every task, of course. We and, every and now we figured out how to get people. It's it's a weird thing because organizing stuff um, in a business is a matter of change, change, grow, change, grow. Check this out. Work on this. But when you're trying to diff, you know, when you're trying to break all these roles out on one night when you're doing a show, it's like you're grabbing six people for this, and it's like okay you're the boss and you start trying to give them the stuff to do. And and inevitably those six people end up each one coming to you. So figuring out who those people are to trust in each of the areas. um, That's something that took us a few shows to do. So, and and from a success mentality, the idea that you're willing to do what it takes, you know, there's some people that I just want to become successful so I can boss everybody around and I don't have to do, they're never going to be successful. They're not willing to sweep the floor if somebody's not available to sweep the floor, but it needs to be done. So they're 
some people like want to be above whatever it is. And I don't think people like that go very far. So it's encouraging to hear where you're at. You're still wanting to pick up a broom. Jeff Fun. and I have picked up brooms and swept big floors oh, yeah. at, at the yeah. Pasadena Convention Center. Hey, I want to talk about another thing about you. You're a heck of a family man. You love your wife. You love your kids. Tell us a little bit about your wife and kids and your family. Okay, so uh, my wife and I have been married for 19 years. Uh, How I, does she put up with you? That's, I, the, I, real, uh, it's that's the real God, question. God, God's grace. <laughs> I've, um, no, she's just wonderful. and uh, She is. Yeah, and it, I, I, I did not, I did not expect that this could happen. I really didn't. But we, we were madly in love when we got married. We were really good for three or four years. We did that seven, eight years, hate each other, try to refigure it out. Uh, we, we made a big deal where we both cut down our list. We had twenty things we expected from the other one. We were fighting about it all the time. Uh, that was around year seven, and then uh, we both realized that really what was important on those two lists was like one or two things, and we found that it was pretty easy to do those for each other. And as we did those couple things for each other, we fell more and more in love, and I love her more today than I yeah. ever did. It's and you can weird. tell it. Yeah, yeah. Tell, tell us about your kids, and I'm getting to a certain point, but tell us a little bit about your kids. Uh, I have a 25-year-old from uh, from my first marriage. I, mm -hmm. I said I was divorced. Um, and uh, he's out in California. This is another thing. He's like many of us. He's had to overcome divorce. Some people haven't. Some people have. Overcoming divorce is tough. But if you're somebody that's went through a divorce and maybe you're struggling, you can overcome it. You're looking at me. You're looking at him. And uh, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I've got a 25-year-old in California. I've got an 18-year-old that's at U of H now. He's about to go to UIC. And then um, uh, I have an 8-year-old girl. girl and, Who uh, runs the family. Oh, gosh, she does. It's terrible. It's terrible. She says stuff to me, and I'm like, if you were one of the boys when I was younger, I would beat you for that. That's and just she, insane. And she knows it. And oh, no, it's terrible. It. It's terrible. So, okay. But she's wonderful. I love her to do. You, you know Mr. S has four. Four <laughs> girls. Yeah, yeah I can't even girls. imagine. Yeah. It's a lot of uh, sprinkles and pink and uh, unicorns, but you get used to it. Four girls. Oh, that's you're a heck of a man. So I worry about my daughter more than I worry about my sons. I just do. So I can't even imagine having not four having of them. sons. I don't know how to imagine any different. Imagine having like one of your girls and you worried about her half as much. That would be having a son. Okay. I want to talk about your middle son, the one that I know. He's um, he's brilliant. He's very successful in school. Yes, and he doesn't want to box, and I can't. I keep trying to get him to box. He, uh, he girls. He's, he's tall and lanky. Tall, guess, good looking. Yeah, it's, hair down. He he wear he he wears his hair like Jesus. Yeah, he's got, long, long got hair. beautiful hair, and uh, but evidently he's got work ethics like you do, or does he? I, I would tell you that it's insane. Whenever he gets focused, he's got like a an unbelievable way of doing things. Yeah, he's just tell us some of the accolades about him. Oh, you okay? So he would he okay? Maybe he won't see this. Uh, he graduated high school when he was fourteen. Um, he just graduated from U of H last year. He's doing a post back year at U of H, and he's how going, old is he? He's eighteen. He's, he's eighteen he'll, now. He'll start his PhD program in Chicago uh, when he's eighteen. He'll turn nineteen after that. Currently, he's uh, teaching a uh, graduate level course at U of H, and uh, he carries it. It's just weird. It's just weird. It's like I'm, I'm thinking about maybe in retirement going back and teaching a few business classes. I got my MBA with the idea that I'd do that, and uh, and I, I think about it with a little bit of terror. And here, my 18 year old kid is up here teaching these 25, 26 year old grad students, and I'm like, look for your son for inspiration. Yeah, in a in a way, I do. In a way, That's I awesome. do. So maybe I'll let him see this so he can know I said that. So, Well, <laughs> I, I know your wife, your daughter, uh, your wife is incredible. And thank you so much for putting up with us, chasing dreams and doing the things that we do. Uh, I do know his daughter wears the pants in the family. And uh, girls have a, a way of doing that, little daughters. And uh, because I've seen you, when you talk about your, your daughter, it's like you change expressions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's all an act. It's all an act. Very cruel, very holding the line. Yeah, no. Right, right. <laughs> we have a we have a meeting with her teacher on Monday. I've got to play like I'm tough on her. Yeah. You got some time to practice. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I'll have to work on that. 
So to close it up, what would you like to leave people with to encourage? You know, obviously you've gone through a lot. You know, the drugs, the alcohol, the, the losing money. If you could sum up how you would want to encourage someone to push through whatever they might be dealing with, what would you say? My specialty is business. So if you have any push towards that, um, there's a statistic out there about business business failures and uh, entrepreneurs who start businesses. And um, each failure that an entrepreneur has increases the likelihood the next one will be a success up to the sixth one. Oh, wow. So you can, you can crash five companies, and that fifth one, that one was more likely to be successful than the fourth, the third, the second, or the first. You got to crash six companies. So if you crash six companies, you probably should just go work for someone else. All right. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. That's some good stats. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for sharing. I know some of those questions from Fermat were pretty tough, but I think other people are going to get some value out of that.